Well, hey everybody, Matt Scalogli here, and uh, a happy new year to everybody. And what I want to do is I want to tell you the story of my first business. Uh, you know, I took a couple weeks off, like a lot of you, or really kind of slowed down over the holidays. And I started thinking, well, and I caught a cold too. Um, I started thinking, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my story, uh, and more so not just for me, but to help you all understand and illustrate kind of how I got to this place. Wound up being owning, or, you know, erectile dysfunction clinics, and kind of how I wound up doing what I'm doing today. Um, so I want to tell you the story about my first business, and I think this is, um, you know, looking back, I just kept on writing this, and it was actually kind of funny. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of background. So I'm 52 years old. I grew up in Chicago. Grew up in a town called Barrington. Um, my father passed away unexpectedly when, in 1981 when I was 13 years old. My mom had to sell the house, and we move up to this place called Lake Barrington Shores in North Barrington. And this was about right at 1983. And so 1984, I started working in the bag room at the golf course there. So we lived in the 17th fairway. There was a big lake there um, in the development, swimming pools, tennis courts. It was like an adult Disneyland. There was a lot of divorced parents and uh, it, that's a whole nother story for another time. Um, and so I started working in the bag room there at Lake Barrington Shores. And I've been playing golf since I was six years old, but this was really kind of like my first time really understanding what went on at a golf club. And uh, this was your typical blue collar entry level Chicago suburb country club. Um, we would pull out carts for the members. Um, we would grab their bags. We would shine their shoes. We'd clean their clubs when they came in. We'd get them range balls for going up to the range. Um, we'd regret clubs. And when it was raining, uh, members would wind up coming into the bag room and we played liar's poker with them. You don't know what liar's poker is. I mean, you basically have singles and you, anyway, you can look it up online. Um, and it was a blast. We would, you know, we would work from six to one on, in this in the summertime. So we'd work from six to one, usually in the weekends, we'd close on Friday nights and then we would work from six to one on Saturday and Sunday. And usually what we would do is we would go out and play golf starting at two o'clock and this is in Chicago in the summertime. So it was light to like nine o'clock and we would play golf until we couldn't see the ball anymore. And, um, it was great because my mom was dating. Uh, she was never there. She was playing golf herself in another place with her boyfriend. Um, and it was heaven. Like I ate at the club. This is like the greatest childhood anybody could ever have, but here's the best part about it. So there was this usual collection of degenerate gamblers at this country club. I mean, it was like straight out of central casting. There were drunks, there were quasi mafia guys, you know, there was, you know, Silvestri. I mean, all the names were absolutely classic. And there was always somebody running some kind of a con. Somebody who's always had some kind of wager going on. Um, most of the members would show up half drunk or hung over from their morning tea times on the weekend. Um, and then they would get loaded after the round and then they'd go out and play like emergency nines and things like that, or they'd play us for money, which I learned very early on. I remember I was playing around one time and, uh, we were constantly beating these guys. And one of the guys came over to me and goes, you know, you want to let them win every once in a while, they'll play you more. Sure enough, you know, we figured out that we need to lose every once in a while because we, we were, you know, we just could clean their clocks. And some of these names were classic. Like these guys' names were the Hawk, um, Cats, the Pigeon, Doc, Padre. Padre was actually a Catholic priest who played golf on Saturdays, not on Sundays. Uh, very good, you know, would always tip you a clean, crisp dollar bill. I swear to God, he ironed and starched them. And then he would not he would not be opposed to a little wager every once in a while. And we were always betting the members. So we would bet them. We'd bet them on putting contests, chipping contests. We'd bet them on which hole it was going to rain at what time. We had this whole system figured out. I mean, it was just, it was great. So one day, my buddy Mike Lyons and I are working. We're both brutally hungover. It's like a June day, a hot summer day. It's 8.30 in the morning. It's wicked ass hot already. And one of the members, I'll call him Mr. Big, pulls up in the front circle with a 7 Series Beamer. I can see the Beamer's black interior, like bronze exterior, gets out of the car holding a gin and tonic. Now, I don't, I don't know if it was from the night before. He just poured himself. He looks at Mike Lyons and I, and he goes, throws us the keys. He goes, hey, grab my bags. I got five pairs of shoes. I need you guys to shine. And by the way, do you guys wash a wax cars? And I literally, Mike and I looked at each other and went, yeah, sure. We wash a wax cars. He goes, great. I'm going to play 36 holes today. Um, so if you can have it done by three o'clock, I'll pay you guys 20 bucks for the car and another 20 bucks for the shoes. Now we've been shining his shoes for quite some time. We're like, okay, <laughs> what the hell? why not? I mean, this is big money. It was 1985. Um, so at the end of our shift, Mike and I drive the car up to the cart barn using the club supplies, the power washer. We wash and wax Mr. Big's car. 
and it looked absolutely amazing. We took him the keys in the bar. He's still with his gin and tonic in hand. He's half shit faced. I don't know if I can say that on LinkedIn anyway. And he gives us the money. The next weekend, he pulls up, throws us the keys, same thing, except this time, right after him, a couple of guys in his group say, Hey, Mike, Matt, I understand you guys are washing and waxing cars for 20 bucks. Can you do mine? We're like, uh, sure. So before we know it, like at the end of our shift, we'd get done at one o'clock. We have this business and we've got like 15 to 20 cars that we're doing on a regular basis, like on Saturdays and, you know, maybe, you know, another, I don't know, six or seven that we're doing on Sundays. We're like, Jesus, this is cutting into our golf time. We couldn't go out and play golf at all. Cause like we would get done, we'd get some lunch. We're like, God, we got to wash and wax these cars. And you know, these, we had to start having a schedule about who was leaving early and who needed it. And sometimes we'd get one done during the shift. And, and so we figured out that, Hey, why don't we call in the guys that are working the afternoon shift, the younger guys, and why don't we pay them 10 bucks a car to wash and wax it? Sure enough, we start paying them 10 bucks a car to wash and wax it. We're making 20. So Mike and I are splitting 10 and we don't have to lift a finger. All we're doing is inspecting the car and we have like little schedules and we like, you know, make sure that it was done correctly. And we still got to go play golf then with the members. It was great until one day, and this was towards the end of the summer, Charlie Carpenter, we're up there, we're inspecting the cars, you know, Charlie Carpenter, the head pro pulls up in a cart and he goes, uh, what's going on? And we're like, uh, we're washing and waxing some of the members' cars. He goes, are you using my supplies and my water? We're like, uh, yeah. He goes, where's my cut? <laughs> so <laughs> we had to pay Charlie like five bucks for the supplies which then we could only pay the guys eight and then we took a little bit less, but it was a great lesson. I mean, um, unfortunately the next year, the club figured out that they could charge 30 bucks and it would be done much more professionally than what we were doing. Um, and the club created their own car washing service and we were out of business, but, uh, we still had a few customers and we would take it to our houses right around the corner. But here's, this was my first lap in an entrepreneurship. And I'm not even sure I knew what an entrepreneur was back then. I, in fact, I know I didn't. Uh, my dad owned his own business, but he was a lawyer. Um, but I'm not even sure I knew what the word meant. But here's, here's a couple of lessons that I learned that still stick with me today. Uh, you know, all these years later, again, I was 16, 17 years old when this was going on. One, it's always easier to sell more to an existing customer. Mr. Big was already an existing customer. He would always tip us five bucks to get his bag. He'd tip us, you know, five bucks a pair of shoes. We were always washing them. You know, we were always uh, shining, you know, three to five pairs of dress shoes for him a week. Um, so you're always going to sell more to an existing customer. If you need to increase sales very, very quickly, sell more to an existing customer. Two, hustle likes hustle. I suspect that Mr. Big and a lot of the other guys at that club um, loved us, loved, and specifically Mike Lyons and I, they loved us because we were always hustling a buck. I know Charlie loved us because we were always, he was the head pro. John Waddell loved us because we were always hustling a buck. Um, I think, you know, a lot of these members, it came from nothing and they loved how we were always finding a way to make a buck. We were always working something. Um, three, it's always better to have somebody else do all the heavy lifting so you can keep your eyes open for new opportunities. We, figured out really quickly that we want we didn't want to work that hard and so we started paying somebody else now we were not making as much as we were before but we had more time on our hands which allowed us to look out for more opportunities uh, one one of those opportunities uh happened to be uh related to uh, figuring out that after the round there were always leftover beers in the carts and uh, that's how we provided our beer drinking when uh, we were in high school and college that's another story for another time um so uh, and then for someone is always going to find a way to cut into your action. Competition is going to happen. Big whoop. I mean, we didn't really, you know, looking back, I mean, we didn't have, have a competitive advantage, right? We we're on somebody else's turf. Uh, you know, we could have taken these cars over to our houses, but, you know, we didn't have a power washer. We didn't have all the tools. I mean, we literally could get a car done in like 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. We had a system down. Um, but the cart barn, you know, was the perfect assembly line. I mean, literally, we could create an assembly line of washing and waxing cars. And we eventually got beat at our own game, but you know what? I learned something. We made some really good money. Uh, we made some great money, um, but it helped me learn something that, and I remember this, I actually found this after my mom died and I was uh, digging this out. Uh, I was going through some stuff. I remember at, when I was about 18 years old, uh, I had to write an essay to get into college. And it was right after this whole thing was going on. So um, 
I think I was 17 years old because I was 17 when I went to college. I'm 17 years old. I found this journal that I was keeping and I wrote down that I was going to own golf courses one day. And that was really the first time, probably the second time actually, I thought that I was going to own my own business. When I was in high school, I'd talk about it. I think I wanted to have a recording company or something, a record producing production company. But I wrote down, I remember writing it down that I was going to own my own golf courses. That was the first written evidence that I knew I was going to be something different, that I wasn't going to wind up working for somebody else. Now, the difference is, is my buddy Mike Lyons, his goal was always to go work for a major corporation, and he did. And he went on to become very, very successful. Um, but, you know, it, it set me the spark on the road. And so here's my question for you. What was your first business? You know, I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, I never trust an entrepreneur. The joke, I have a friend of mine says, I never trust an entrepreneur that never had a lemonade stand. And, um, you know, it's it's the great story of, hey, what was that first business that you had as a kid growing up? Maybe it was selling, uh, my buddy Chris Tomshack had a business selling, he would go door to door selling seed packages, um, uh, lemonade stands, car wash businesses. Um, uh, you know, I had buddies that had painting companies in high school or, um, you know, I had a friend of mine that started beers around the world when he was in college, uh, eventually sold that for 40 million. So, you know, you just never know what it is. So, uh, tell us what's your story. What was your first business? I'd love to hear it. Um, look, have a great new year. Uh, you'll be hearing more from me here shortly, but, uh, I hope you enjoyed this little story and I will talk to you soon. Thanks.